Hi guys, it's Mrs. Ratliff. I'm going to read The Screech Owl Who Likes Television by Jean Craighead George. Twig's favorite pet was a small gray screech owl. Had he not fallen from his nest before he could fly, he would have lived in the open woodland deciduous forest, park, town, or river's edge, but he had landed on a hard driveway instead and ended up in our house. He was round-eyed and hungry. He looked up at Twig and gave the quivering hunger call of the screech owl. Twig named him Yammer. Yammer quickly endeared himself to us. He hopped from his perch to our hands to eat. He rode around the house on our shoulders and sat on the back of a dining room chair during dinner. Before the green of June burst upon us, Yammer had become a person to Twig who felt all fr wild friends were humans and should be treated as such. Wild animals are not people, but Twig was not convinced. One Saturday morning, she and Yammer were watching a cowboy show on television. They had been there for hours. Twig, I said, you've watched TV long enough. Please go find a book to read or do your homework. My voice was firm. I kept the TV in my bedroom just so the children wouldn't be constantly tempted to turn it on as they had when it was downstairs. Reluctantly, Twig got to her feet. At the door, she turned and looked at her little owl. He was on top of the headboard, staring at the screech, screen. Sorry, A rider on a horse was streaking across the desert. From an owl's point of view, the pair were mouse size. How come Yammer can watch TV and I can't, she asked, pouting. Hardly had she spoken, then Yammer pushed off from the headboard, struck the prey with his talons, and dropped to the floor, bewildered. Twig rushed to his rescue. She gathered him up and hugged him to his, her chest. With a scornful glance at me, she hurried to her room. The small owl's round yellow eyes were peering from between her gently curled fingers. Twig was right. This other worldly creature was a person. Wasn't his menu of mice and crickets included on the shopping list? Didn't he have his own bedroom in the gap between the Roger Tory Peterson field guides and the living room bookcase? Didn't he run down the, in the, to the cozy blanket tunnels made by Twig at bedtime and utter his note of contentment? And didn't he like TV just as she did? Most scientists are taught not to read human emotions until into animals, but sometimes they wonder about the truth of it. When you live with animals, they often seem quite human-like. Later that morning of the TV incident, I looked in on Twig and Yammer. The owl was perched on top of her open door, preening his feathers. She was sitting with her chin in her hands, looking at him. I feel sorry for Yammer, she said. He's stuck in this house. He needs to see things that move like they do in the woods. So I said, so I finished my homework and made my bed. Can Yammer and I watch TV? I heard myself whisper, yes. When I told Twig she could watch TV that day of the cowboy incident, she stood on her desk and held up her hand to Hammer. He stepped onto her finger. As she climbed down, she touched his toes and the talons curled around her forefinger. I wish I had Yammer's feet, she said. Then I could sit on the teeny tiny branches of the apple tree. Yammer loved Roadrunner. Twig said and dashed, on to, dashed to the TV in my bedroom. Yammer flapped her wings to keep his, Yammer flapped his wings to keep his balance and the two joined Twig's brothers, Craig and Luke, before the television. Luke, not quite four, patted the pillow next to him. Put him here, he said. A chord of music sounded, lights, lights flashed, and all eyes, per particularly Yammer's, were riveted on that zany bird running on and off screen. Second to Roadrunner was Yammer's love for the shower. He would fly into the bathroom when he heard one of us turn on the spray, sit on the top of the shower curtain rod to orient himself, then drop into the puddles at our feet. Eyes half closed, he would joyfully flip the water up and into his wings and dunk until he was soaked. A wet screech owl is as helpless as an ant in an ant lion's trap. Having bathed Yammer couldn't climb out of the tub. We would have to pick him up and put him on a towel by the hot air vent to dry.
that was a perfectly satisfactory arrangement until we failed to tell a visitor about Yammer's passion. In the morning, unaware of his quiet presence, she showered, stepped out of the tub, and left him there. It was almost noon before we discovered him. Craig promptly put up a sign, please remove the owl after showering. It hung over the shower faucet for as long as Yammer lived with us. Yammer was devoted to Twig. He sat on her shoulder at breakfast, flew to her hand for food when she whistled for him, and roosted on the window curtain rod of her room, and when he was not watching TV, he did like Craig's train set, however. He had reason to. It moved like a garter snake. The tracks that Craig balanced on his big wooden blocks run, ran under the bed, then out across the floor, past the chest of drawers, over the main line, and back under the bed again. When Yammer heard the train start up, he would fly to the back of the chair in Craig's room, crouch to drop on this prey. He watched engines and cars ply the precarious rope. The blocks were, would shudder as the little black locomotive swung around a curve or speedily crossed a ravine into the open stretch between the wall and the door. Yammer never struck the, this prey. The train was not the right size. Yammer was programmed to eat mice, insects, small snakes, and arthropods. The big owl, like the great horned barned and barred and barn owl pets of my childhood, might have pounced on Craig's train, but not Yammer. He just sat and watched in a house that lacked d d diving blue jays and scurrying chipmunks, black darling, as Craig called the lionel train, was biologically diversity, biological diversity to Yammer. His head fairly spun off his shoulders as his eyes followed the speeding engine around the room, under the bed, and out again. Often the train tra train wrecked. Craig ran into the ran ran it on the bleeding edge of disaster. And when the building block shifted too much, Black Darling would jump the tracks, knock down the trestles, and careen through the air before coming to rest on his side, wheels spinning with each crash. Yammer took off for Craig's door to talk, where he would study the dead engine until its wheels stopped turning. Then he would look away. When the train didn't move, it wasn't there. This was, I skipped showing you a page. The owl in the shower. And in the bedroom. One evening, a screech owl's plaintive call of spring floated through our window as we were going to sleep. The voice came from the spruce trees on the other side of the lane. The next day at breakfast, I put down my fork and leaned toward Twig, Craig, and Luke, smiling. They put down their forks and looked at me with that, oh boy, here it comes, expression on their face. It's time, I said, the eyes widened, the fingers tightened on the table edge to set Yammer free. No, 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 the third voice and the round came in. Don't let him go. He'll stay around, I said. It will be lovely to have Yammer in our woods flying, calling to us at night and coming to the window for a mouse or two. No, 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 no. Maybe he'll even have owlets and bring them to us, silence as they thought about that. I'm going to feed him on the window sill of my bedroom for a few days, I said. When he knows he can always get food there, I'll open the window and he'll fly off. I'll whistle and he'll come back. No, no, said Twig. He won't. Yes, he will, I said. Don't you remember Boobo, Twig? No, she said. I was just born when he had Boobo. Boobo was a great horned owl, I explained. She lived with us for four years at Vassar College, and then we let her go. Don't let Yammer go, said Twig. Boobo came back every evening to be fed. I went on. When she found a male great horned owl in the nearby woodsy graveyard, she moved off the campus and into the woods with him. They raised two owlets in an old crow's nest. No, no, shouted Luke and Craig. Don't let Yammer go, said Twig. A week later, we met in the bedroom. Yammer had been eating mice and chicken on the windowsill for a long time now. I said, the moment has come to open the window. They looked at me as if I were an owl executioner. He'll be back. He's very hungry. Eyes widened in disbelief. 
No one spoke. He'll fly to the ba base basswood tree to get his bearing, I said quickly. Then I'll whistle the, the come get the food call, and he'll be right back. No, don't, said Twig. We'll feed him just a little bit tonight, I continued. He'll still be hungry tomorrow, and he'll come back for more. We'll do this every night until he can hunt on his own. I was facing an audience of skeptics. I had to convince them. When I was a kid, I hastened to say, we had a barn owl named Wendy. He was Uncle John and Uncle Frank's lovable owl. They set him free, and he came to the sleeping porch every night to be fed. Yammer will, too. Yammer's not a barn owl, said Craig. That, that evening, we let Yammer go. Twig was hopeful. She trusted that Yammer would come back. Craig was still skeptical, but Luke was brightened by a new awareness rising in him freedom. The owl would go free. He liked that. As we opened the window, Yammer blinked his golden eyes and swung his head in a wide circle. He saw the best wood tree, Mr. Ross's spruces, the sky and the rising moon. Spreading his wings, he floated into the twilight. We never saw him again. And that's the end. Bye.